Amen. Amen. And hey, happy Mother's Day. It's so great to see you here today. Uh, we welcome all moms and everybody here. We're so glad that you're here on this beautiful day. Uh, hey, we've been in this series called What's Next? And today we're going to talk about what's next uh, for women. So we're here to honor moms, all moms, but we're to talk to all of our females who are here today, all women, our girls, our daughters, grandmothers and moms, single, married. We're so glad that you're here today. We've been in this series that you can see called What's Next. We've been post-Easter talking about what's next, post-resurrection, post-Easter, so what? How has the resurrection changed our lives? And it's, uh, I guess, simple to say it this way. It's changed everything. It's changed everything about our lives. And we're going to see how the gospel comes to bear on what it means to be uh, a woman. But this message, of course, is for all of us here today. Jesus, of course, was for females. He was for males. He's for freedom, empowerment. He's for value and beauty. And today we're going to dive into what Scripture says about what it is to be fully human and fully woman. So 2017, uh, ended up being the year of the woman. It will forever kind of be known as the year of the woman. You might remember that uh, in October of 2017, the hashtag Me Too movement really went viral, not just nationally, but internationally, uh, a movement against sexual harassment and uh, an assault that spread uh, quickly. Gwyneth Paltrow was one of the uh, early ones to come out. Uh, in fact, calling out uh, Harry Weinstein, um, who was a, is, was a Hollywood director, uh, Angelina Jolie, along with others uh, who came out, Ashley Judd uh, and others who really this movement just started to go viral. In fact, at the end of the year, uh, because of the rise of women in the year of 2017, um, Time Magazine uh, in their famous you know, person of the year, they named The Woman. Uh, really the silent accusers who came out. You might remember it was that year that uh, Bill O'Reilly, other, I mean, you know, other people that are well known, Bill Cosby, uh, even the, the infamous now Access Hollywood video came out uh, with, with what uh, President Trump statements that he made about women that made international news. And now just over the past couple of weeks, a little closer to home, uh, the president of Southwestern Seminary, uh, it has been now under fire for statements that he's made uh, in, his, in the past. And now there are thousands calling for his resignation. Uh, stay tuned to that story. Uh, but I, I say all this to say now on this day, as we honor mothers and as we honor all women, uh, I feel the need to say this. As a Baptist pastor, let me be explicit that the oppression... The, the, the demeaning abuse, whether it be emotional, verbal, physical, sexual abuse against women, any kind of form of misogyny, violence or abuse of any kind should not be tolerated in any place, no place and at no time is this acceptable behavior. And we're going to talk about what the Bible says in this cultural moment. Uh, to what is next for women. And I'd say it this way, what's next is now. Because the reality of what God has said about women is already at play. And today on this day, we're going to celebrate all of our women, as I've noted, but it's Mother's Day. And we just want to pause and honor you, moms, for your hard work day in and day out. I, I've said this before. I've felt it. I've seen it. I believe that women carry a greater emotional weight in regard to, um, to parenting children. We say it often, gosh, at gravesides and, and, and uh, memorial services, that grief is the price we pay for love. And because I believe there's no greater love than the love of a mom, love of a mother, then I, I, I think it's logical to believe that there's no greater grief than the grief of a mom. That can come in a lot of forms today. And today is a tender day for a lot of us. But perhaps you need the encouragement of God's word today. And I want to bring that uh, to all of us here. Maybe you're in that season. Maybe you're, you're a young mom. Maybe this is your first Mother's Day uh, that you've ever experienced. Maybe you're in those days of nonstop laundry, carpooling, 
coaching, uh, homework, and all of those kinds of things. And I just want to say this here, all of us with a mass confession, mom, just take a deep breath, just <sighs> exhale, and let's have this kind of mass confession. There are no super moms. Wonder Woman is not for real. And, and we know, mom, what is behind that great smile of yours. You make it look easy, but we know what's back there. Laundry, grocery shopping, carpool, it's not even my birthday. I love that. Don't let Mother's Day be that way either. How about this one? The first 40 years of parenthood are always the hardest. It feels like that, doesn't it? Some days, long days. Wow, I get to give birth and change diapers. What a gift. How about that? And here's a guy. He's coming in with the, with the vacuum cleaner. Oh, honey, it's practical and thoughtless. All right, I hope Mother's Day gifts. Hope you're a little better than that. And then I love this one. Make yourself at home. Clean my kitchen, she says with a smile, drinking her coffee. Mom, we know what you're thinking, but you hide it so well. But remember this, on those long, hard days, especially as a young mom, you, you need to be reminded today uh, that your worth and your value is not determined by uh, the capacity you know, or your energy that you have. It's not determined by your dress size or, or how, how, how good you look the cleanliness of your home. In fact, you need to remember Proverbs 14, 4. It says, where there are no oxen, the manger is clean, uh, but abundant crops come by the strength of the ox. You know, there's coming a day when you're going to have a clean stable. You're going to have a clean manger. Uh, but it's going to happen, frankly, when the kids are gone. I mean, unless your husband's a problem, and then you, you'll figure that out. But uh, and, until then, you're going to have a house it's going to be messy and alive with kids. Praise God for that. Uh, praise the Lord for that. And you just go one day at a time. It's been said that, that the years are short, but the days are long. And so if you're in that season, uh, be encouraged today. But we've got to think biblically about this uh, topic of what, uh, what biblical womanhood and even motherhood looks like. I'm talking to a lot of single women here today. I want to speak to our young people and even our girls who are here today. And I want to encourage you because as we talk about this, we've got to confess as, as a church. And I, I confess as a pastor that the church overall, um, I think our church better than most, frankly. But we can do a better job. But the church has been historically, we, 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 we've seen women who've been sidelined, even exploited uh, in, throughout church history, largely denied a legitimate place at the table and a voice because of their gender. And, and that some of our God-given gifts to our women have been silenced. And this has happened in our churches. It's happened in our culture for way too long. And all of us have suffered for this. All of us. And, and we need to see today, as you will see as we look into Scripture, women, you are equally, uh, equally created in the image of God, equally gifted by the Spirit, equally called into ministry and, and, and the proclamation of the gospel, wherever God has placed you as ministers, as teachers, CEOs, housewives, businesswomen, politicians, leaders, soccer moms, wherever you find yourself, it's your responsibility to seek the Lord and find how He is calling you uh, to serve Him right where you are. So we've got to think biblically, uh, guided by the Spirit, seeking to learn and to grow. And we need to do it this way. Uh, there's so much that's being said. Women, I know this, so much in our culture that's coming at you. So many voices are saying how you ought to live your life and be this or that. The latest blog you've read or, or, or whatever you're, you're seeing on the news or reading online. But, but we've got to recognize that we often now in our culture are polarizing opinions we don't want to hear from others or we put people in certain camps, whether you're egalitarian or you're complementarian. You know, it's all equal. Everybody's the same or no, we have certain roles. We often I've seen it this way where people claim to be egalitarian, but they but they what they practice is complementarian that that no, we clearly have different roles. And, and clearly we're going to see today that men and women are created differently. Others say, well, I'm clearly, you know, there are certain roles that when reality uh, you, you, you really serve and, and work in a way where we're all equal. So, so how do we manage this tension? And, and, and is it simply to dismiss the feminist uh, or what some have called the evangelical feminist 
uh, in our day? Is radical feminism the answer? Or can we, in fact, embrace legitimate uh, feminist perspectives that have played into great strides for women? I mean, think about the fact the suffrage movement back in the early 1900s really started long before that. But it was 1920 when the 19th Amendment came about when women finally could vote. Uh, and then it wasn't until 1965 that minorities could vote in America. So we can't simply dismiss uh, radical movements that have taken place in the past. But is radical feminism really the biblical approach? Because, you know, misogyny, that is hatred towards women, can be met or countered with this hatred towards men. And there's lots of talk, uh, lots of people who are down on men in our day. Uh, and that can be, you know, met with, with a hatred towards men. And we know that the way of hate is never and has never been the way of Jesus. Now, what I see in our culture today, not so much misogyny, uh, a hatred towards women, but more uh, sexism, sometimes in subtle ways. Uh, we see it in our culture. We see it in, in business. We see it commonplace in the workplace, in sports. And often it comes simply, uh, even in the church, it can happen where we're simply uh, maybe not, not taking a woman's perspective, not listening well, not honoring and validating perspective of women and what the female uh, experience brings to the table. And so today, what I want us to do, there's lots of places we could go here. I've got a brief period of time to talk about this. The best place to go is to start in Genesis chapter 1, to go back to the creation narrative. And I want you to turn there, Genesis chapter 1. We're going to look at the creation of male and female and what that spe how that speaks into this cultural moment that we're in and how we can apply uh, things that we see in Genesis into our lives. So if you'll turn there. Now, chapter one, you might know is a summary of creation. We get to chapter two where you see more of a detailed outline of exactly what takes place. All right. So let me read Genesis chapter one. We're going to look at verses 26 through 28. Then we're going to look at more of the detailed passage that we find in, uh, in Genesis two. So it says here in verse 26, then God said, let us make man. And that word, by the way, is, is it's Adam, but it's mankind. It's, uh, it's going to become a proper uh, name in a moment uh, in chapter 2. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Notice it says our, okay, the triune, preexistent God before creation. And let them have dominion, okay, rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. What is all this creepiness? What he's saying is that, hey, Humans are going to be the highest of all creation and over all, given rule and authority. The cultural mandate is to rule and subdue, subdue and rule the earth for, for, uh, for, for culture making and for the flourishing of all mankind and all creation. Then verse 27, so God created man, there's mankind, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. It says, now look at this, verse 28. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. So this is the cultural or what's called the creation mandate right here. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the, of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so God saw everything. It says in verse 31, and behold, he said it was very good. All things very good. Now, the summary of, of creation, um, the creation narrative, the first summary of it all, the kind of a comprehensive kind of summary uh, ends in chapter two, verse four. It ends there. And then the details begin. So it's kind of now retelling in detail. And, and so uh, I want you to jump to chapter two, uh, verse seven. He breathes into the man, nost into his nostrils. He breathes the breath of life. He makes man out of the dirt. And then he says he puts him in a garden to work it. Verse 15. And he can eat from any tree, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, as if God is saying, um, I alone will determine what's right and good for you, not you. I alone will determine this as you follow me and my commands. He says you can eat from any tree, but not that one. If you do so, you'll surely die. In verse 18, then the Lord said, it is not good that the man should be alone. 
So again, now we're back to just man. He's there. And Adam created by God. He's there. He's got everything. Think about this. This is prior to the fall, which comes in in chapter three. He is in paradise, but he's still not blessed by God because he does not yet have a helper suitable for him. It says then in verse 18, this helper that's that's fit for him. And so God uh, takes out of Adam's side, out of his rib. You know this, he falls into deep sleep and it's often said at weddings, uh, she didn't come from before him, behind him, above him or below him, came from his side. You see this kind of co-equal in creation. And then Adam says, I love this in verse 23, this is at last, at last, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman, ish because she was taken out of man, which is ish. There's these, uh, this play on words there. Came, come out of man, uh, both created in the image of God, and then the two are to become one flesh. They're to join together, and they join then in this co-creation, uh, co-equals in the image of God. So here's what I want you to see. Um, this, this, this idea, what some people have in the creation narrative is, well, man, you know, he's all that. And woman just came alongside. She's going to just help him. Uh, he needed a helper. Uh, it, it's the same word that's used later in the New Testament for the Holy Spirit, who is our helper, who comes to help us. He's not diminished or somehow less than us because he's our helper. In fact, she comes along. It's as if to say, I'm going to accomplish what humankind is to accomplish, which man cannot accomplish alone. And of course, we know this. And when you come to the, the cultural mandate of, of being fruitful and multiplying, I know a lot of us think, well, there you go, you, you, you have children and such, right? Well, we know this, men, we can't pull that one off alone, right? Uh, and, and so uh, here's what I want you to see. Uh, as we think about what's next for women, the first thing I want you to see is this. Women are created in the image of God. Okay, so I sh- that should be clear to all of us. Let us make man in, in both women and men, and men are created in the image of God. Eve will bring a greater uh, expression, if you will, created male and female to the Imago Dei, to the image of God. So people nowadays were thinking, well, is, is sex or gender, is that a social construct? Um, like you can just kind of, no. The Bible says we're created male and female. Now watch this. Race is a social construct. In fact, science now has proven that all races can be drawn back to this region of the world where we find Eden, the Garden of Eden. And and again, that science is now proving what the scriptures have said for thousands of years. But in our cultural reality now, it seems that that our genders is just kind of up for grabs. And no, the Bible says that God has created us male and female. So with all of these ideas in our culture today, is that because we've now evolved or somehow smarter than we used to be? Or is it because we've turned away from God's word and what he has so clearly said to us about the Imago Dei? He's intentional in creating us male and female. Women are created in the image of God, just as men have been created in the image of God. Secondly, I want you to see that women share responsibility in the creation mandate. He gives to both male and female the cultural mandate that is to subdue and rule to, to again, to be fruitful and multiply. And guys, you know this. You don't have to know much about biology uh, in regard to multiplication. We're not bringing a lot to the mix. I mean, we're bringing, can I say it, microscopic something to the mix. And, and, and women are bringing the... <laughs> The, the weight of it all from, from, uh, from for nine months, the transformation of a body, uh, unless there's adoption involved. But we see this, 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 even there, the woman takes on this emotional weight and connectivity, connection to, to, the, to the baby that is being born, the one she holds in her arms. And, and so it's why uh, the author uh, Elizabeth Stone has said, making the decision to have a child, it is momentous. It is to decide forever to have your heart walking outside your body. And I think there's a greater connection there. Women, deeper feelers, uh, uh, there's a greater connection there for women. But here's the thing. 
in Christ. Now, as we think about the church, we have an equal value and equal responsibility to obey and serve the Lord. That's what this means. All scriptural commands uh, in the New Testament to surrender to God, Romans 12, 1, and to service towards God in Romans 12, 1, and dedication of our lives to the Lord all over the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 7, 33 through 35, apply equally to men and women. Women are, are given gifts. The Spirit dispenses gifts to men and women. We're called out to serve God, to share the gospel. But listen to this, men and women, again, are not the same. And this is the confusion in our culture today and scripture and the creation narrative bears this out. So look, women display an indispensable difference. All right. So we're created in the image of God. Women are women share in responsibility, the creation mandate and women display an indispensable difference. God created us male and female to comprehensively display his glory. But here's the thing with so much uh, kind of frustration as we think about roles or diversity of roles or what can women do or should they do this or not do this. The one Christian distinctive that we've got to remember from our society is that our value is not tied to our role. And this is where I think many of us get, get mixed up. It's frustrating to talk about roles sometimes, but women have a responsibility before the Lord to steward their gifts that God's given them. And, and, and then to, to, to fail to do this is to fail to be obedient. And for the church not to release women in every way that they've been gifted is a failure of leadership on the part of the church. But men and women are different in many ways. We could talk about this for a long time in big ways. And as long as for many years, social scientists have tried to tell us that men and women were well, pretty much just the same. And I think it's a lot of the reason why we've gotten to where we are with gender, uh, or gender confusion, uh, you know, dysphoria and all kinds of challenges that we see in our day is because we've not been clear and we've not set forth a biblical manhood and biblical womanhood. Men are men and women are women. And as much as social scientists and others have tried to say we're just alike, a science is really coming back around to say, no, 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 we're vastly different. There are indispensable differences is how I would say it. Not only are we miles apart biologically, uh, but scientists have shown that we uh, experience reality differently. So that when men and women interact, uh, there are truly two worlds, uh, his and hers. Consider a couple of studies that were done. There's a university study done where they had students blindfolded down in these hallways that were below the campus buildings. And they put them in, the, uh, in, in, in these hallways and they asked them then to walk around and then to find certain buildings, go to certain buildings. Well, the men uh, had a real clear um, you know, kind of directional uh, compass within them. And they could, and almost none of the women could do it, but the men could find their way to different, you know, buildings uh, under, underground, blindfolded. Uh, chalk went up for the men, right? But before you put too much money on the men, there's another study done where they brought uh, students into a room and they told them to wait for the experimenter who was going to come into this cluttered kind of office space. They came back a couple minutes, I think two minutes later, and th what they didn't know was that was the experiment. So they brought him out and then they asked, hey, tell us, give us every detail you can remember and think of in that room that you saw. And the women were 70 percent better than the men recalling, remembering, noticing, seeing, uh, having this greater kind of view of their environment. So chalk one up for the women. But uh, who's keeping score? Um, the men are, by the way. Uh, because the men, again, are more competitive. Now, some of you women are as well. But what we see here is that, that men and women are created differently. Our differences go much deeper than our brains, uh, how our brains work differently. Women, uh, but, but even, even with the brain, women have this kind of crosstalk across their left and right hemisphere of the brain so they have better verbal skills generally and relational intuition. Men have a greater, on the other hand, a greater brain hemisphere separation, which enhances abstract and visual spatial intelligence. So he is purpose driven. She's heart driven, right? He's goal oriented. She's feeling oriented. Uh, he operates specifically. She operates holistically. Men are segmented. 
Women are connected. It's been said that men are like waffles. You know, they have all these these compartmentalization kind of things going on. Women are like spaghetti, thus uh, can multitask a little better. Men are from Walmart. Women are from Nordstrom. Uh, Men are looking for the hunt and the kill. And you I got it. Let's go. You know, that's me shopping. I need a shirt. Bam. There I'm out. And I can't take that for long. But Nordstrom is an experience. I mean, there are other shops that you might go to. Women want to feel it. They've got to experience it. And and so every little boy is asking, uh, do I have what it takes? Every man is asking, do I have what it takes? And every little girl is asking, am I lovely? Am I lovable? And, and, and so the, the man, see, he wants to hear, that makes sense. Thank you. You've been so helpful. And the woman wants to hear, I understand. Tell me more. So men, listen, that's worth the price of the ticket right there. Okay, go with that. Go with that. Because that'll help mama be happy. When mama's happy, everybody's happy. Okay, I understand. Tell me more. So men, uh, that's the best advice I can give you. That's, that's, that's great stuff. Come back on, my, on Father's Day. I got more for you. But, but that'll, that'll help you. Okay, so, so males may often, uh, too often take a lot of credit. But it's the female who is doing so much of the heavy lifting. Uh, now, I could not, you know this, I could not pastor this church if it were not for my wife, Stacy. I mean, I couldn't do much of anything in my life if it were not for Stacy. So often there, there's, a, there's a woman behind any man that's doing anything great in the world. This is not always the case, but, but often the case. I know it's true in my life. We see this in the animal kingdom as well. I thought this would be kind of fun. Um, I want you to see that the lion, he's the majestic, you know, you've heard this, kind of the majestic king of the jungle. Uh, actually, he's not. Uh, he's the king, but it's more of the savanna or, or the grasslands. He's rarely found in a jungle. But look how majestic this guy is. But the lioness is no doubt the queen. All right. You can see how they love each other. A lion is the best killer, but the lioness is the hunter. Look at them. Look at them loving each other. The lioness protects the, the pride. But check this out. The, the, um, the lion king, uh, his... His roar can be heard from five miles away. That's a roar. That's like, don't come around here. But I want you to check mama's teeth out, though. See, as as awesome as he is, I've been told that the lion is a great killer, especially the big prey. But the but the lioness is the hunter. She's the one that goes out and gets. And I know women are you thinking we do it all right. I mean, she does. She goes out and gets food and brings it back to the lion And she also brings it back to her cubs. Now, look at this. Now, you know, he said something that he should not have said. And he's getting an earful. Man, he's shamed. You can tell the big king of the lion. He's been told what's up. And and here's the thing, too. Uh, Lionesses are one incredible mothers, incredible moms with the little baby cub. Uh, And some of you moms, you felt that before. Yeah. Nipping at my tail. Get away from me. Right. Um, But she, of course, gives birth to the princess and the princesses just as we do. And when we embrace our diversity, see, uh, this is my point. Lions and lioness, they 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 feed off each other, if you will. They work together. But when this happens, then look at this. There's peace in the world. But it's when we accept our, our diversity. Diversity, you see, it's just true in every relationship, brings about change and transformation without differences. Without our differences, there really is no peace and ultimate joy in life. So next, I want you to see that women demonstrate an an undeniable capability. All right. Women bring a strength and a vitality to the mix that is most often underestimated. Oh, God didn't underestimate it. Uh, But think about it. The supposed weaker sex, I think, brings a quiet, powerful confidence, a competence and a skill, a potential that 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 some that many men don't have. And I think here's why, you know, in many ways I see this in the in the African-American community and minority communities, this kind of faith that is forged through through suffering and through oppression often. 
It's a powerful faith. There's certain uh, elements of our faith that are only forged in those ways, not by being the king of the jungle, but by being the one who has walked through grief, who's walked through difficulty, who maybe has been somehow oppressed, as many women have been in our culture, somehow subjugated. Uh, there's this galvanizing faith that comes through the refining fire of God's grace in our lives. And so women, listen, you must release that. You must live that out. You bring to the table something that most men don't experience. I know that Stacy and I, we always sought to raise our daughters as women of strength. But we've got to remember, too, that, that godly feminism is not tied to a personality. I think we often think, man, she is a strong. Well, no, she's kind of boisterous is what she is. You know, I mean, she's kind of kind of dominant. Well, no. See, a strong woman, the Bible often describes as one who's quiet and gentle of spirit. But as we've sought to raise our daughters in the Lord to be daughters of the king, their worth is not determined by, by their own ability or power. And when you've been given this kind of power, galvanized through a, a journey of faith, we're blessed to be a blessing. You use that to raise up others on behalf of others as we see Christ displayed in Philippians 2. Women are gifted to serve God. And, 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 and women will be and are now central to the mission of God. Therefore, the mission of the church, she's essential and indispensable. God's call to be fruitful and multiply, listen to this, is still operative today. Through now, watch this, the new Adam, Christ comes, the incarnate God, born as a man. He, sorry, he identifies as male. He comes, he is a man, and he walks the earth among us. He dies on the cross for our sin. And before that, lives the perfect life on our behalf. It's where all of our worth comes from. And then he calls us in to join him in this new creation that all of culture and all creation may find its way back to the garden. So the new Adam, Jesus, calls us out. And the, and the mandate, the Great Commission... Matthew 28, 18 through 20 is to go to be fruitful. John 15, we're to be fruitful as we walk and abide in the vine. And we are the branches. We're to be fruitful in our lives, to live in obedience to him. And then we're to multiply as we make disciples. Listen, moms, that is your greatest calling in life. Dads, all of us here, the greatest calling of our lives is to make disciples, to raise up others. This is the new cultural mandate, the great commission of God. And I want to say it here at Park Cities Baptist Church. You need to hear me say this. We still believe it's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for men to come around and have some, some you know, boys club and say, let's run this thing. In fact, women bring a perspective, a nuance, a weight uh, to, to the mix as, as no man can ever bring. I was in many meetings, happened to me all the time. I was in meetings this week where with a woman at the table, or about women at the table, there's a completely different spirit in the room there, there's, there, that, that, that men cannot bring. And so without women, without women in leadership, without women, we may as men, we may fight, but we'll never win. In fact, we'll probably fight against ourselves and we're better for it. You know, the evil one wants a house divided. He knows a house divided will fall. He knew it from the beginning of creation. And every family is under attack because he knows it. Every church is under attack. But when we work together, we see God do great and mighty things. But listen, it's not just our women. Our, how about this? Our girls who need to see strong, vital, competent uh, women who are leading ministering, serving, yes, in their own personality, in their own roles, wherever they may be found. But our young men, our boys need to see women who are confident, godly leaders in the home and in, in, the, in the church. And I praise God that we're in that kind of church. That's the comprehensive view of the Imago Dei. That's what God wants us to see. So finally, and to close, women await an indescribable destiny a glorious future, and an expressible eternity. And I say this because, listen, if you are in Christ, then your future is locked up. It's guaranteed, not because of anything you've done, 
but because of what Christ has done for you. Your eternity is fixed. And if you live with the end in sight, women, listen, what's next is now. You can live knowing that God has created you in His image. He's created you with a responsibility in the creation mandate and now in the Great Commission. You, have, you can display an indispensable difference as we express to the world what it means to follow Jesus every day. Women demonstrate an undeniable capability. You have capacity and capability beyond your imagination. Because God has planted it there. So if you live with the light uh, in light of eternity, then it's time then to, to know it's, it's not by comparing yourself to other women. Women need to encourage other women, not be envious of other women. Let's encourage one another. And, and it's not by by. You know, saying, man, if I just looked like she looks or if I was just like her, she's just as broken down and sinful as you and I are. And instead, we find our worth in him. Your worth is not found in the fading fashions of the day or in your decaying body. I'm sorry. So we can just stop focusing on the temporary and turn our hearts toward the eternal. So your purpose is found in joining God in what he's doing in the world. And he's called you and gifted you. He's raising you up to do so. But first, you've got to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. You will forever be seeking your worth and your value in something other than him. And you will never find it apart from Christ. So here's what I want to do. I want to pray over you as we close our time together on this Mother's Day. And I'm going to do this. Uh, I want to ask, not to embarrass anybody, but I want 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 us just to honor our moms and our women, single and otherwise, all of you, girls among us, our children, we want all of our females, I want you to stand. Would you just do that and everybody can kind of see you around. I want you to stand and, and I just want to pray over you as we close our time together. Would you bow your heads and, and, and close your eyes with me? We praise God for you. Lord, we thank you for these women. I praise you for my mom today. I thank you for her encouragement in my life every single day. I praise you for the strength that I've seen in her life. How she loves you so much. And I thank you, God, for these women. I thank you for these mothers. We, we first praise you for our moms, all of us. Have a mom, had a mom who, who gave birth to us. And we thank you for them today. But I pray over these women that each one will know that they are created in your image that they they have gifts that you have given to them specifically to use to your glory. And I pray that you'd encourage them today. They would not grow weary in well-doing, but they would fight the good fight that you called them to in these days. So Lord, may they flourish. May they find their worth in you. And may they know that you've called them for a purpose. And so God, we all commit our lives to you. And I pray for those here. Friend, if you don't know Christ, if you've never received the grace of Christ, you can do so now. Ask him to come into your heart to forgive you of your sin. Thank him for dying on the cross for you. and Give him your life today. Lord, we love you. We praise you. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.